<tie> Mevrouw de rector, dank, dit staat niet op papier. Dank u zeer. Ik was hier niet op voorbereid. Het enige goede wat ik hier uit afleid is dat iedereen nu begrijpt dat als ik halverwege in tranen uitbarst, dan kan ik u de schuld geven. Met name het citeren van Trevor en Karin um, was ik blij mee. We are living in a technological culture. That was the summary of my inaugural lecture in 1995. I want to move from that question now to uh, how to study technological cultures to the question how we construct them. In a few big steps, I shall take you from the social construction of technology to constructing socio-technical ensembles and finally to the constructing worlds, the institutions in which this construction work takes place. The starting point for science, technology and society studies, which I will call STS henceforth, especially in the Netherlands and Scandinavia, was an engagement with societal issues in the 1970s and 1980s, such as nuclear energy, the nuclear arms race, genetic modification. From the 1980s onwards, an academic detour resulted in what now is an emerging, if not booming, discipline. The thrust of this academic detour into research and teaching was constructivistic. Scientific facts are not discovered by taking away the cover, uh, picking up the facts. No, rather, scientific facts are constructed in social processes in the laboratory, the seminar room, the journal's editorial office, and the lecture hall. In a similar move, some of us then argued that also technology is socially constructed, not in the trivial way that machines are designed and manufactured by people, but in the sense that the working of a machine results from social processes and not from physics, chemistry, or mechanics. Let me briefly illustrate this with an example. Let's talk about biogas in India. The first time I heard about this was at, as a potential solution to a huge problem that twice a year occurs in northern India. Farmers burn their rice straw that is left on the fields after harvesting and a thick layer of smoke covers the foothills of the Himalayas and northern India, including India's capital, New Delhi. The smoke is not only causing traffic jams in the capital, it's also polluting the environment and it is toxic for farmers and citizens. A new chemical treatment of that rice straw now promised to make it fit for producing biogas. With that biogas, electricity would be produced and that could in turn benefit the farming communities. Everyone happy? <coughs> well, not quite. When we analyzed the social construction of this biogas, a more complex picture emerged. We identified different relevant social groups and mapped what biogas meant for each of them. And rather than one biogas, a whole range of different biogases emerged. I will mention a few now, the others you can read in the extended version of this lecture. For most farmers, the burning of rice straw is not a problem, it is a solution. Since the Green Revolution, farmers in Punjab have been charged with the responsibility to feed the nation and have been pushed to produce up to four crops per year. After harvesting the rice, they have only three weeks to clear their fields and prepare for sowing wheat. Most of the farmers do not see any other solution but burning the straw. For them, biogas would not be a solution but an extra burden collecting the straw from the fields, storing it, transporting it to a biogas plant, it would just cost too much labor, money, 
time. And additionally, Punjab villages typically have enough electricity anyway. So this is the first biogas, a non-issue, a no biogas. The second biogas we see when we use the perspective of organic farmers. For them, biogas is part of a solution, but the solution to a different problem. Their problem is not primarily the smoke, but that burning the straw destroys important nutrients which they would like to give back to the soil. However, rice straw cannot be ploughed directly back into the soil. It first needs composting. And feeding it into a biogas plant would help. A biogas plant produces waste, and that waste can be used as an organic fertilizer. So, for these farmers, biogas is not a solution to the smoke. It's not a non-issue. It is a fertilizer-producing biogas. A third and very different relevant social group is the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. Their mission is to make India more energy secure and to meet the international CO2 emission agreements. A very ambitious biofuel program has been started, which mostly builds on producing second generation ethanol. Since a few months, also biogas is gaining importance again. So, through the eyes of this ministry, we see a biogas for energy security. Using this biogas case, I can now briefly summarize the core concepts of SCOT or the social construction of technology. SCOT shows how a technology results from interactions between social groups. I demonstrated that the interpretative flexibility of biogas exists in that there is not one biogas, but at least three different ones. The next question then is what happens to this interpretative flexibility? Which of these different biogases wins? I shall return to this question later. Let me now continue with my historical sketch of SDS. In the late 1990s, some in SDS began to argue that we had learned enough during our academic detour to return to the societal challenges. My inaugural lecture was part of that move. This implied several lines of work. The first line relates to expertise. SDS has shown that scientific facts are socially constructed. Does that imply that there is nothing special about scientific facts, uh, scientific expertise? Can we do without science just as well? No, we cannot. Our technological cultures are so thoroughly permeated by science and technology that it would be foolish to think so. Yes. Early SDS work in the 1970s demonstrated that science is human work. But that was to counter the almost priest-like status of scientists in society, which made them immune to critique and democratic governance. These days, many SDSers find themselves underlining the valuable character of scientific knowledge. For us, in SDS, there is, of course, no contradiction. Scientific knowledge still is socially constructed, but we also show how this social construction yields knowledge of a particular kind and a special value. As a brief intermezzo, what then is so special about scientific facts? In a world in which alternative facts figure so prominently these days, it is tempting to overstress the objectivity and the certainty of scientific facts. But then we would be falling back into the pitfall of quasi-objectivity, a pitfall out of which we have been climbing since the 1970s. So I have to that question, what is so special about science, I have no better answer than the following. 
Scientific and scholarly facts are produced and validated by a complex social machinery with specific values. The scientific community with its unwritten rules, scientific methodologies, peer review, etc. This does give scientific facts a special value. But it does not imply that these facts cannot be uncertain or that it is impossible that next year we will conclude that a particular statement is false, which today we still consider a true fact. It also shows that controversy between scientists is normal and no reason to lose trust in science. How can citizens and policymakers make sense of scientific facts, especially if scientists are still not in agreement? A distinction that Harry Collins introduced is very helpful. Citizens and politicians only need interactional expertise, the expertise to interact with scientists. They do not need contributory expertise, the expertise to contribute new scientific knowledge. Thus, policymakers and citizens without scientific training can discuss questions about the use of science and technology in society. An example that this indeed does work can be found in the Netherlands' national dialogue on nanotechnology. The Dutch government decided to have a societal dialogue on the social and ethical aspects of nanotechnology and to do this even in an early stage of the development of nanoscience. With this decision, the government followed an advice of the Gezondheidsraad. The results of this two-year dialogue process involving thousands of citizens and stakeholders were the following. One, a small but significant increase in recognizing that nanotechnology in, uh, that nanotechnology, uh, no, sorry, sorry. The first one is a small but significant increase in understanding what nanotechnology is, including the benefits of nano. Second, an equally small but equally significant increase in recognizing that nanotechnology involves risks. And finally, thirdly, an increase in support for continued nano research. I draw two conclusions from this. First, that citizens are not afraid of new science and technology, but that they are afraid of governments, scientists, industrialists, who do not tell them everything, including the negatives. Second conclusion, that it is possible to discuss such complex scientific issues with citizens and stakeholders who are not trained in that specific science, who have only interactional expertise and no contributory expertise. In the past two decades, we have seen a change in the social contract between science and society. The reasoning now is our societies are confronted by grand challenges, health, food, sustainability, climate change, security, and we want science and technology to help us address these. The Dutch National Research Agenda, the NWA, is an example. In this NWA experiment, everyone in the Netherlands was invited to submit questions to science. Citizens, NGOs, municipalities, businesses, together they generated more than 11,000 questions. These were then filtered and validated by the Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences, the KNW, and some questions were filtered out, for example, because they were impossible to study scientifically. My favorite example of one such question is, does life after death exist and can we commercialize it? <laughs> A complex institutional machinery, including scientific review and stakeholder conferences, processed the remaining questions into a national research agenda and a science investment agenda for the new government. 
My second example of society steering research is the Dutch research funding agency NWO, and particularly two recent changes in its practice and structure. The first change was the introduction of the top sector policy of the Ministry of Economics in the NWO practice. Whatever one may think of the top sector policy in general, for example, that it is too nationalistic, too narrowly economic, but those were political choices, I do think that NWO succeeded to develop a set of practices to manage research funding under this top sector scheme, which allowed societal shaping of research without jeopardizing the scientific quality of it. Responsible Research and Innovation is one such program to which I will return later. The second way in which NWO adapted itself to allow more influence of society on science was, was its recent transition into a different organizational form. The new NWO comprises of only four disciplinary domains and a few cross-disciplinary steering groups. Let me use Votro Science for Global Development as an example. The research funded by Votro aims at contributing to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and to inclusive global development. A broad range of societal partners from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to NGOs such as ICO, HIVOS, Cordate, can approach Votro with research questions and funding possibilities and Votro will then coordinate with the relevant NVO domains to organize the funding and organize the whole process of publishing calls, selecting the best proposals, etc. Research funded by Votro raises questions about the relations between science, technology and development. One way to rethink development agendas and the role of science and technology therein is to put vulnerability of technological cultures center stage. In doing so, SCS researchers have added the cultural to the societal, Gemeinschaft to Gesellschaft, solidarity to security, precaution to prevention, justice to legality. They argue that more attention to ethics and justice needs to complement current styles of governance and policy making. This broadening has direct implications for development and intervention. More intervention points become visible, more intervention strategies become available. Let me return to our current biogas project in India. I have introduced Scott as a research heuristic. By identifying relevant social groups, I could demonstrate the interpretive flexibility of biogas. Using Scott, however, also means that one is making an intervention. Such intervention is often, often inevitable, but intervention can also be deliberate and planned, as is often the case in development research. Identifying new social groups, giving them a platform, may, for example, change the discourse and even the power balance between social groups. Our symmetrical analysis of biogas thus pushed us to help the organic farmers to explicate their views of biogas. This made our research better, but it also empowered farmers. And it was thus an intervention into the socio-technical ensemble of rice, straw and biogas beyond doing the research. Does this mean that we are not only studying the social construction of biogas, but that our interventions also actively contribute to that social construction? But what mandate do we have as researcher? Where to draw the line between understanding 
and intervening between research and development? Or is such a line not possible and should we rethink the character of scientific research? Programs of Responsible Research and Innovation, or RRI, or RRI as I will say from now, underline the importance of such a rethinking exercise. RRI programs explicitly seek to translate societal challenges into research goals and questions. Our biogas project is such an RRI project. RRI aims at a more responsible development and use of science and technology in society. It aims at technology and research that have the right impact. Being alerted by RRI's raising of normative questions, we could now even identify more biogases than the ones that I reviewed previously. That is, for example, the holy biogas. This is a byproduct from the cow, since cow dung has the best bacteria to break up rice straw. This harks back to the ideas of local sustainability, recycling, where nothing is waste, and at a time when cows were part of every household, treated as almost part of the family, and loved and prayed to. This is proper, solid farmer's knowledge. But it is now being hijacked by Hindu religious groups who thus see biogas as a way of reviving the glorious past of a Hindu India while having the benefits of enough fuel in their present socio-technical world middle class. So here we are, researching and intervening, studying biogas and intervening in Indian society by asking RRI-type questions. What to do with this double identity? In our interventionist role, we are just one social group amongst the others. There's nothing special about us if it is about intervening in society. But now I do have a problem, since as researchers, we do have a special role. Scientific facts have a special and precious status when compared to alternative facts. And I do want to contribute to maintaining that status and, where needed, restoring the status of and the trust in science. Talking of trust, what does the previous analysis of the role of researchers as also interventionists imply for our democracies? I do not join the chorus of lamenting that there is not enough trust in science. Research by the Ratenau Institute and the Netherlands Scientific Council for Government Policy, the WRR, has shown that Dutch citizens still trust scientists, at least more so than they trust politicians and journalists. <laughs> trust, however, needs to be symmetrical. Yes. Society should trust science, but science should also trust society. And that is exactly what RRI asks us to do. To take social groups and society seriously, to listen to stakeholders' views about risks and benefits of knowledge and innovation. Trust also comes in tandem with control, with regulation, review, protocols. Trust is also, like control, shaped by constructing worlds, the institutional machineries that I am focusing on today. Let me return to biogas for the last time. How will that story end? Which worlds will be constructed? Which of the, which of the biogases will win? Will it be the holy biogas surfing on Narendra Modi's Hindu populist and violent nationalism? or the energy security biogas as spurred by international relations and international capital, or the fertilizer producing biogas of the organic farmers, or will we stay with the current no biogas? Asking which of these worlds will win the construction struggle 
is asking which of the groups can push its knowledge, its values, its interests most. But is this the kind of democracy that we want? A fight about who is strongest in constructing his world? Remember our vulnerability analysis. Then a different set of criteria for democracy lights up. These are about community, justice, precaution, solidarity, and about plurality, variability, creativity. They are about global inclusivity, sustainable development, and guarding fundamental human and ecological rights. Is this romantic daydreaming? Not necessarily so. This is not only a moral argument. We need not depend only on people doing good. One way of summarizing three decades of STS work is to emphasize the complex social processes and institutional machineries that construct scientific knowledge and that make the quality of democracy. Backstage processes in Dutch advisory councils as well as Indian NGO practices to organize creative dissent. The way these machineries and practices are organized is, of course, not innocent. They will promote certain values and frustrate others, depending on how exactly they are shaped. So, this will be the challenge for our final biogas conference in September to devise mechanisms of deliberation, fact-checking, learning, consensus-building, accepting differences, so that groups can see that things could indeed be otherwise than in their own limited perspective, to engage those groups in constructing a world that solves the problem of rice straw burning, but also farmers' livelihoods, ecological sustainability, India's energy provision, and yes, why not, industry's economic stability. Here, research and intervention will come together. We will present our findings, but not as a scientific dictate that prescribes one solution. We will also intervene by creating platforms to make the social groups interact with each other in novel ways, and thus generate new solutions that no one may yet have seen. This exemplifies the fundamental question that I have been talking about today without once mentioning it clearly. How can we make science accountable to society and make it work, make it function in our democracies and let it produce scientific knowledge. How can researchers give all relevant social groups their due and play their own role as scholars? And how can a Dutchman recognize the differences in power between West and East, between white and brown, between male and female, between academic and not formally trained, and take his, my, responsibility to act in the world and to contribute to constructing a better one. <coughs> my friend and colleague Trevor Pinch always says, try to make only one point in your presentation, you'll probably end up making two. <laughs> so my take-home message today is twofold. One, about societal institutions, and the second about personal style. First message. To construct a world for the next generations that can cope with the grand challenges that we face, and to do this in democracy and without war, we need to invest in our societal institutions, in the constructing worlds, in the machineries of democratic deliberation and knowledge production advisory councils, peer review, high quality journalism, public dialogues, open source science, a strong civil society, scholarly ethics review, etc. 
Second message. Whether we are researchers, activists, citizens, we all need to combine confidence in our own expertise with modesty when listening to others who speak from another expertise. Let us cherish a style of bold modesty. To begin the last part of this lecture, in which I want to thank colleagues and friends with whom I have worked these past 30 years in Maastricht, I must start by mentioning what is possibly the most important intervention that any academic can have, teaching students. Certainly in Maastricht, this is a very collective endeavor. I'm deeply grateful to all colleagues of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences with whom I have been doing this exciting and so rewarding intervention towards constructing a better world. There's only time to mention a few of these very many. And it feels weird to address you in English, even including Sally. Um, on the other hand, this is not personal, it's also public. So I will publish these lines in English, but now switch to Dutch in talking. Onderwijssamenwerking is heel bijzonder geweest met Annie Hommels in de Bachelor en Master van CBS, met Jessica Mesman in Est, met Karin Beisterveld in Kaast, en met Sally Wyatt en opnieuw Karin in WTMC. De andere kant van lesgeven is leren. En dat gebeurt niet alleen door de studenten. In mijn oratie schreef ik, het is uiteindelijk de onderwijzer die het meeste leert van de omgang met studenten. En ik kan u melden dat tenminste dat uit mijn oratie, die voorspelling uit mijn oratie van 22 jaar geleden is uitgekomen. Ik koester de herinnering aan de samenwerking met studenten en AIO's. Dit is de belangrijkste bestaansreden van universiteiten, van deze instituten, van deze constructing worlds. Deze bouwplaatsen kunnen niet bestaan zonder de cruciale ondersteuning die de interne machinerie draaiende houdt. Zo dank ik Merle Achten en Sanne Winkens voor alle steun bij projectverwerving en management. De mensen van Bureau Onderwijs hebben mij en eigenlijk alle andere docenten veel meer geholpen dan wij verdienden. En dan is er natuurlijk het secretariaat met Sabine, Jacqueline en Diane. Sabine Kuipers heeft mij meer dan 25 jaar bijgestaan en u wilt niet weten hoeveel kuilen ik in was gevallen zonder haar hulp. Misschien wilt u het wel weten, maar ik ga het niet vertellen. <lacht> Met Wiel Kusters deel ik niet alleen goede herinneringen aan ons gezamenlijke bestuurswerk in de jonge jaren van deze faculteit en haar voorganger, maar ook aan avonturen in de geschiedenis en poëzie van mijnen en mijnwerkers. Rijn de Wilde is een collega en vriend geweest sinds Gerard de Vries ons naar Maastricht haalde. En hij is belangrijker voor mij persoonlijk en voor de faculteit dan ik in een dankwoord als dit recht kan doen. Sophie van Honakker dank ik voor haar steun die ze biedt met evenveel vriendelijkheid als doelgerichtheid en strategisch inzicht. Ik ben erg blij dat Harro van Lente is benoemd als hoogleraar van wetenschap en techniekonderzoek en nu onze kapgroep en het MUST onderzoeksprogramma leidt. Het college van bestuur en het faculteitsbestuur ben ik zeer erkentelijk dat zij het mogelijk maken dat Harro twee jaar geleden al begon en belangrijke rollen van mij in de faculteit kon overnemen. Nu tot slot mijn dochters en Tony. In de oratie heb ik mij op dit moment achter een weliswaar oprechte, maar ook vrij abstracte en daardoor lege formulering verscholen. Laat ik vandaag bij deze laatste openbare gelegenheid dat niet doen en iets concreter zijn. Natuurlijk heb ik genoten van de samenwerking met Lieselot aan haar medische geschiedenis, met Elze aan haar reflecties op malariaonderzoek, met Sanne aan de oerrolvoorstelling van haar cellenwalktijd Amsterdam. Maar mijn grootste dankbaarheid is voor wie jullie zijn. 
Ik, de truc is dat ik jullie niet moet aankijken als ik dit voor je <lacht> Drie sterke vrouwen die hun leven zo mooi vormgeven. Ik heb meer door en van jullie geleerd dan een vader mag verwachten. Over sterke vrouwen gesproken. Tony, je bent veel belangrijker geweest in mijn werkleven dan je je vermoedelijk realiseert. Ik zou bijvoorbeeld niet in India terecht zijn gekomen, nog onderzoek naar weven zijn gaan doen zonder jouw inbreng. Maar belangrijker, want mijn ruim 40 werkzame jaren omvattend, zijn jouw kritische betrokkenheid en feilloze sociale intuïtie geweest, waarmee je op cruciale momenten steun gaf en soms ingreep. Voor mij ben jij een honorair SDS'er en ik weet dat je daar absoluut niet van onder de indruk bent. Maar ik ben je ten diepste dankbaar. Deze reden ging over constructing worlds, over het maken van een betere wereld. Dat doen we voor volgende generaties. Ik heb even met de gedachte gespeeld om deze reden op te dragen aan die generaties, aan alle kinderen van deze wereld. Dat zou veel te pretentieus en daardoor mal zijn. Deze reden draag ik op aan onze twee kleinzoons, Waldemar en Tristan. Mevrouw de rector, ik heb gezegd.